And let me make sure I'm sharing. Cable share. So I could use the other room. Um, Visible. You're, you're working on the bed. No, no, I'm not going to put it back there right now. I've just been out for four years. Is that is the or is the was that on? I see the slides. It looks good. You're looking good. Okay. So I'm gonna let's see. Once everything goes, I will just start. Okay, YouTube is working. Um, yeah, but we have to wait for it to populate a little bit. Yep. Yeah, so wait a little bit, and uh, so let's let's see. Cables going, and oh, the share stopped. It looks like. Sharing is visible. Uh, yeah, to me, can you move it or can you move or something? I see the mouse moving. Yeah. Good, that's great. Then I'm good. All right. Ah. Works good. Oh, thanks. So, for people watching on YouTube, I think I posted this link. So, Kiran Kalaya is also running another online course right now. So in algebraic number theory. So I'm gonna post this into the, uh, the Zulip. Um, and so I think you guys should pass this around to see if there are other people interested in a, in a algebraic number theory course. And I think it's gonna be focused on Sage and, um, you know. I should, put a, I should put a link in the blog just in case, just to give yeah. people an added chance to see it. All right. Great. So maybe what before we start, I can say a few things too. Anyway, uh, just to get them out of the way. Let's see. So, uh, yeah, if, yeah. Great. Okay. So we're we're not starting just yet, but I'll just so. Uh, but we're so my. I'll just say where we are and what my plan is. Uh, uh, so I'm planning, as I'd said before, one more after this, and the uh, sort of the where I wanted to get to. Uh, I think there's going to be a reasonable ending point. Uh, and time-wise, we're now into our quarter, and things are uh, quite crazy, as you probably may or may not imagine. I guess it's uh, with a situation both uh, medical, political, and academic. So, uh, uh, so I think that, uh, I'll have no problem next week but uh, I'll continue to be, I think I can say things, but I'm now way behind on things like uh, uh, the Zulip, et cetera. So I, I haven't, I won't quite say I've given up, but I it will go and look at them later on after we're in some sense after uh, pseudo lecture 14, maybe more. And so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I can say something else too about the software update. So like I have been working on, so I've, I've been using the software for problem exchanging for my class this semester, and it's been working well. And I'm working on another version, and so that's probably going to be ready for the next Agitalk. So right, yeah. we, we we might be interested actually at Stanford to use it too for for courses if you are. Uh, yeah, absolutely. How, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah. On yeah, on yeah. how like what shape it's in. Yeah, uh, and then where when and how the next will happen. Uh, it will then be a little bit up in the air. It'll be when I next have, uh, it, it'll depend on the way in which chaos uh, gradually shakes out. So yeah. uh, so I have potential, uh, I know what I'd like to do, uh, but whether I do it or I do it soon, I don't know. But, but I think we tentatively had thought that a month break at least would be good. And I could imagine it might be when the quarter is over that it might be possible, but we'll see. Um, great. So I'm thinking that uh, since this is only partially synchronous and partially asynchronous, I'm just going to get started in a minute or so. I want to just make sure everything is live. So YouTube is on. Yeah, yeah 51, 52 people on YouTube. Good, perfect. 
Uh, and then do we have, um, let's see. Okay, I think, am I, so what am I forgetting? These are, I'm not, if you're not to be forgetting anything obvious, we'll find out in a bit. Um, okay. Okay, I mean, I'm gonna leave you then. Great. And I will have a few seconds pause to, so I can slice and dice to uh, eventually cut off the first few minutes. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the uh, most likely uh, second last pseudo lecture of, of Agitalk, or at least this edition of, of Agitalk, where we're nearing the end of where we want to go. Uh, our last meeting will be next week. If all goes well, it will it'll happen next week. If all goes well, it'll be the last meeting. Uh, and we are nearing essentially the end of the first, I think, three parts of the notes. Uh, and today we'll have some punchlines. And next time I want to do some, I want to discuss a few things on images of schemes and some like classical images of varieties and some classical, uh, at least some classical geometry. So let me, let me start by reminding you, because it's been a few weeks on what we've discussed recently. Uh, and that's uh, uh, closed embeddings or closed subschemes. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, they're often called closed immersions. I'm, I, I think I, I haven't checked and maybe someone will be able to, I bet someone will be able to quickly answer this, that I wonder whether that phrase is a mistranslation from French, uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I prefer the, the older phrase of embedding because reasonable geometers have already used the word immersion to mean something else. And yeah, it, it, I don't mind, it's not a problem using the same word for something different, so long as you never want to talk to them. But I found that they actually are quite reasonable people. And so to avoid confusion, I, per, I deliberately always say closed embedding, even when I'm annoying algebraic geometers in conversation. Uh, and that's basically the same thing as closed subschemes. And again, this is a question of, of annoyingness or not. It's like when you say something is a subset or something maps isomorphically onto a subset. It's the, uh, it's purely, it's in some sense, purely semantic. So closed embeddings means that we're not, uh, like you're mapping in this picture, X is mapping into Y, or maybe X is a subset of Y. Uh, and so our, the definition of closed embedding that we're using, which is equivalent to all other reasonable definitions, uh, it, but the starting point is that it's going to be affine. Uh, it's going to be an affine morphism, which means it locally looks like a spec A to spec B. And then as an affine morphism, you get a ring map, and the ring map is surjective uh, on, on, every, uh, on every affine. So, uh, and notation used for this is often the hook right arrow. Uh, it's imperfect because the, uh, you're not, it's also, that's also used for open embeddings, for example. And you can get around that by simply adding in, uh, often it can be convenient to say something like closed or something like that. Okay, so some quick observations about, about these. Uh, so the, uh, the first thing is that because it looks locally like a spec R mod I to spec R, uh, it, uh, you get this, this continuous map uh, expresses X, uh, expresses the, the thing being embedded as a closed subset of the target. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, so it is kind of complementary to the notion of an open subset. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so in particular, you have a complementary open sub scheme because an open subset gives you an open sub scheme. But there's this asymmetry between closed subsets and open subsets uh, on the scheme side, where open subsets do correspond to subschemes, but closed subsets, uh, every closed subscheme does give you a closed subset, but it's un but closed subsets, there could be many, many different closed subschemes we've discussed some. Uh, and so maybe a, a rhetorical question is that, uh, is that if you have an open subscheme, it's, it could have many complementary closed subschemes. Is there a best one? Uh, uh, and what do you think makes it a good one? That's is also cheap to show it's a monomorphism, uh, closed embeddings are monomorphisms. And the other thing I'll say is that really this is the geometric geometrization, the geometric version of ideals in a ring. This corresponds to closed subschemes and schemes. And maybe I might say the actual correspondence would be an ideal sheaf and then the closed subscheme would be the R on I. But in any case, th this really is the, the geometric notion where things can vary of, uh, of, of ideals inside rings. Great. And, uh, and to, uh, what's, since schemes and varieties are 
especially explicable in terms of affines, because we have these special kinds of open sets, uh, as opposed to other geometric spaces, uh, then, uh, so we do know that uh, given a scheme and you have a closed, and if you have a uh, closed subscheme, uh, then for every spec A, every open sub, uh, affine open, we get a corresponding ideal, which I'll call I sub phi, where that's the same phi. Then, uh, and so every closed subscheme gives something like this. And then the question uh, is, if you, give the, if, you, if, I, if you have this data, how do you know if it really comes from a closed subscheme? It's not an if and only if, and things are slightly, uh, it's not even if it's a sheaf. Uh, and it has this kind of behavior. So there's one extra condition that this data determines a closed subscheme, which looks kind of like this. Uh, if and only if, given these ideals, the ideal on, so the great thing is all you have to worry about is the distinguished open set. Uh, and, uh, and so given the ideal for A and the ideal for A sub F, uh, the ideal for A sub F is, the, the, of A localized at F, is the ideal for A localized at F. Did I, uh, let's see what I should put here. I phi sub F, I should put it inside there, I think. Oh no, I called it a, did I call it a phi? Uh, uh, ah, doesn't matter. Uh, that's a pi, oh, that's a, good, sorry. It doesn't matter too much, uh, except that I wanna make sure things are right. Uh, great. So in other words, and this really is not just, uh, this is something which is actually useful, which is there are many recipes which most cheaply give ideals for every affine and it's easy to check that they satisfy this property and then boom, you've got yourself a closed subscheme. That's all you need to check. And so that's, uh, and so there's an exercise for you to see if that's true. Oh, and uh, I should say that it, uh, there are other, as I said last time, definitions of closed subschemes, and you could show these are the same. And I even in the notes there's an exercise that'll walk you. Well, actually, I don't know if I bother walking you through it. Maybe walk you through it, but just pay attention to when you prove something, when you suffer, and when you don't suffer. Uh, and so when you uh, uh, and when you're so uh, and you, I think if you don't go through that definition, you suffer much much less because you're talking about schemes on their native terms, uh, uh, which is affines. Uh, and so you have, you may have to, when talking to other people, at one point do this exercise to connect it to this, this other definition. But I really don't. Uh, if you're going to start in algebraic geometry, I would not start there. Okay, great. So now uh, we we know in in topology, if we have a subset, we can take its closure to get a closed subset, which is the smallest closed subset containing that set. Now you could have a similar notion of scheme theoretic closure, uh, uh, which says that it's a small slow sub scheme containing, well, something, uh, some sort of, uh, I should say, I, I'm being somewhat vague with what I mean. So, and, and the way to be less vague is instead I'll define scheme theoretic image, which really it's a closed sub scheme. So the official phrase is scheme theoretic image, but you, uh, I feel like it's useful to really realize that the closed sub part is silent, but really everyone, uh, no one says the required part out loud um, except for me. Okay, good. So that means it's a smallest closed subscheme. And we do, you already know, uh, you, you can check that you can intersect any number of closed subschemes to get a closed subscheme. How do you check? It might be actually useful to realize this ideal criterion will make it really easy. You just define it affine by affine and show that your constructions play well with inverting, uh, with localizing at one element. Okay, so that's the definition. And we give some examples, I think possibly in the question period after. Uh, and, uh, and the one thing which is different for schemes, it's because it's not just a subset, you get this fuzz. Uh, so you, in reasonable situations, you could just work it out locally, just like you can in topology. In other words, given an open subset of the target, uh, it's easy to find out what closed subscheme you should be talking about because you just look at the functions uh, that happen to be zero when pulled back to X. So that's, that's the algebra version of this. And there's your ideal. And, the, and so, in any reasonable case, that should be true. Uh, and how do you check if it's true in your reasonable cases? You could, all you need to do is go back and use, I'll flip back again, this criterion. Uh, and so then using that, you can readily check. Uh, and you can read that if you want that. So long as you're in this reasonable situation of X being reduced, which is extremely reasonable, certainly if you're in uh, thinking about varieties, or even if it's just quasi compact, if you, as long as you can cover X by finally many affines, you win. So that's uh, then, then the scheme theoretic closure is kind of what you think. Um, and more precisely, uh, well, maybe I should, uh, I think I, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. 
Okay, so once you have that, then you have locally, uh, you can define locally closed subscheme just like you define locally closed subsets. And in topology, in point set topology, a locally closed subset is just an open intersector closed, or if you want, it's an open inside a closed, or if you want, it's a closed inside an open. Uh, and so life is good and easy in points at topology land, but life is less good in algebraic geometry land because those three things are not always the same thing, but two of the three are the same. So we'll define it by an open and a closed. Uh, and if it's an open and a closed, it's also could be a closed intersect and open, which is a fiber product. And, uh, but it's not always, not, uh, but these are not the same as closed inside opens. There's some closed inside opens, uh, I hope I'm gonna. I hope I'm not gonna end up eating my words and saying something stupid, because uh, I've got a. I I had I thought I had a hundred percent chance of being right, but if I, I may only have a fifty percent chance if I was not thinking clearly. Uh, uh, it, that so everything of this form, uh, uh, may uh, may not be a closed followed by an open, uh, and so the so basically if I told you of something open inside a closed, I could say well what is it closed inside that would be open. I would just take the closure of X. And it's because the closure of X, that thing is weird. Uh, and you have this weird criterion that there you have to be really careful. So life is good when you're dealing with reduced or quasi compact things. That's a good, that's my, that's one of my fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental th uh, theories of life. Uh, and in that case, all is good, but otherwise you may not be. And if you're the kind of person who like 99% of the people in the world lives in this kind of situation, then you don't have to worry about this. Okay. Uh, and then, oh, maybe one last thing is locally closed subschemes, uh, also locally closed embeddings, you, uh, you, uh, is the same sort of deals true there. Some people, I think there's a convention that when you say subscheme, you mean locally closed subscheme. I don't know if that's I'm not even sure if it's, it's not, it may be written somewhere or may, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, worth avoiding because I don't know, like I always get, uh, I think whenever everyone says this, they really mean that. And I know no counterexample, but the notion of that being a subscheme, I should think, I mean, it plausibly should be something else. So I think it can't hurt to be more precise and just always use locally closed subschemes. Great. So good. So now we have these notions of morphisms. And as always, at this point, you, you are thinking that I better make sure these behave well. And now even know about what behaves well means, it, uh, they should pull back. You should determine if something is one of these guys by checking locally on the target. And you should be able to compose two of them, get a third. Uh, and all of these are cheap because you know it's true. You can check it local. Well, you can check it cheaply with closed embeddings. And locally closed embeddings are compositions of closed and open. So that means uh, they're going to be good too. Uh, and the added bonus is there are extra facts that they are monomorphisms. And again, because open and closed embeddings are, and the composition of monomorphisms is a monomorphism. Although maybe I should say, maybe you haven't seen why that's true, but we'll get to that in a second. Great. So now, so you can impress your friends with something sounding really fancy. Uh, if you have, uh, so if you have a, uh, uh, composition of morphisms, and the uh, and you have a. Uh, uh, I wonder whether I want to say this later. Actually, let me take this back. I think I put this in the wrong place. And let me. Uh, so coming soon. You can impress your friends later, just not right now. Uh, okay. So now we're getting to stuff. The main uh, meat of today, which is going to be basically Hausdorffness and related issues. The Hausdorffness part is very cheap and fast, but it's the related things where things become cheap but interesting. So, okay, so why do I want to define Hausdorffness? Why do we like it? Uh, and as, as I've, I think we discussed before, repeat more than once that, uh, okay, we know we like it because we have this as a condition for manifolds. So uh, that's, so we could just, you know, just nod our heads wisely and stop because surely in that class, we learned why we needed that. But I, okay, but maybe you don't remember, and maybe I don't remember why we added that. So let me uh, come back to that later. Great. Okay, good. So let's set up. First, I want to make I want to point something out, which is that if you have any morphism at all, this has nothing to do with house dwarfness. Uh, no, actually, I'm sorry, a morphism of affine schemes. Uh, then, uh, so spec something to spec something, spec A to spec B. Then I claim that the diagonal morphism is a closed embedding, and just to have a picture. There's uh, in this picture, y is a point, since it's, uh, it's kind of a sketch, and it's x cross x, 
um, with the two projections and there's the diagonal map. And so why, how do I know it's a closed embedding? Well, I know, so, okay, it's spec A to spec B. And then what's the diagonal map? Well, it's gonna, that's what it is. And that's an affine to an affine. And what's the map on corresponding map on rings? Well, you have to unwind the definitions a little bit and it's worth doing it. Uh, and it's a map from the tensor product of A with itself to A. But now the unwinding is that, what, what does it do? Well, it sends a tensor of two things to their product. And more generally, what an element of this is a finite sum of tensor of these two things. So it goes to the sum of those things. And then really cheaply, this is surjective because you can certainly hit one by taking one tensor one, for example. Or you can hit anything like lowercase a in capital A by taking one tensor A. So that's good. Great, so that's surjective. Therefore, that's a closed embedding. And now if you have an arbitrary morphism of schemes, then I claim it's gonna be a locally closed embedding cheaply. Why is that true? Well, uh, let me fix an affine open cover of X. Uh, and so, uh, so then, uh, I don't think I meant something there. Uh, great, so, so then you can cover X cross X. Uh, if you remember how we showed the, uh, this, we use this in effect, or we, we proved this, it came up in our discussion is how we, how we even constructed the fiber product. And the fiber product of two things over uh, something else, we can get at by taking, covering them with a having an affine cover of the left and the affine cover of the right. And that looks like Cookie Monster or something. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, sorry, I should get back to, get back to work. Uh, the, the, uh, so, so, uh, so you can cover this by UI cross UJs. And now I want to point out that if you just use UI cross UIs, then you, you, don't, you, don't, you may not call it, cover all of X cross X, but at least for sure you cover the diagonal because, uh, because UI, when you map UI in, it'll map to UI cross UI. And so, you, so each open set of X is going to map into something here. So this is going to be, this is going to map to the diagonal, but then this, then this is, if, if I take the union of these UIs cross UIs, locally, the pre-image, locally it's a closed embedding because that's affine, affine, and affine, affine, affine. So hence we've shown that uh, this map is a closed inside an open, which means it's a locally closed embedding. So that's always true. Uh, okay, another example, let me do projective space over, over uh, so consider the projective space over a ring. And so we'll use that morphism. Now I claim that it's a closed embedding. And again, I, we just showed it's gotta be locally closed. That's true for any morphism schemes. So let's, okay, but so now let's just check it out. Now we wanna cover X cross X and we know it's covered by US, UI cross UJs. And I guess maybe if you want, I could be a little bit careful and say, remind you that this is over spec A, but that's okay. Uh, and so it suffices to just check this one. So we need to check. Uh, so, we, so all the open sets look either like the UI cross UI, which we've already dealt with, or UI cross UJ. So if we could show that we get, when we map PN into the product, it's a closed embedding, even when you restrict UI cross UJ, that should make us, then we, then we win. Uh, that's there's only one other kind of, inter, of product we have to worry about. And, but that's something we have coordinates for. So we just write down what that is, which is, so there's UI uh, is a spec of, if you remember the notations, it was uh, X zero mod I, uh, over I, you have N plus one variables, but one of them was one. And now the intersection of UI and UJ, which if you parse what the diagonal intersect UI cross UJ is, that is the intersection that involves inverting xji. So now you've done one extra thing here. And on the other side, the map is to the product of two UIs. So I just have one of the UIs, I'll use y variables. And again, I have n plus one variables, one of which is one. Uh, and then I have n plus one z variables, one of them is one. And so that's an af map of affines again. So now I can just go ahead and check on rings. So I, I look at the rings. And my only question is, if it's, is this rejected? Uh, if it's rejected, I win. But now I just see what the map does. And oh, what is the map? It's sending y for k, k over i to x over k over i, because that somehow corresponds to these variables correspond to these variables. And these variables correspond to, well, I guess we have the j in the denominator there. And so z, if you parse what z, k, j maps to, 
it should be xkj, which is xki over xji. And so this is just surjective because you can see that you get each of these generators, including one over xji, which is xij. Okay, so all I mean to say with this proof, which I think uh, following it in real time is slightly tricky, but sitting down with it for a minute, you, you should hopefully see that you can absolutely follow what this means. Okay, so here's, not, here's an example where it's not, a, the diagonal is not a closed embedding. It is a locally closed embedding, it has to be, but if you take the line with the doubled origin, which is one of our first examples, our example of our pathological scheme, uh, and you map it to A1. So the map looks like, uh, let me zoom in. The map looks like the, the F on them with the doubled origin and maps to Y and it's just the identity, except at these two points where you have both the points go to the same. And so really it's two copies of A1. So it's, I really I should put, that's A1, that's A1 and they're glued together everywhere, but at that point, but I can't make that infinitely thin. It only zooms in so far. Yeah, I keep trying. Great. So now let's work out what the diagonal is, x cross x over y. It's the fibered product, which means we can work out the diagonal by taking by asking for points on x and points on x, uh, two points on x that map to the same point on y. And it turns out then that if we if we name our two points uh, uh, in the line in the double of your doubled origin, maybe the first origin is called zero sub one, second one zero sub two. Then in the product you get zero one cross sub one cross zero cross two, zero two cross zero cross, uh, let's probably be ones, zero cross two, cross zero cross one, and zero two cross zero two. And your map, uh, your map mapping this in sends, it's a diagonal map. So you hit this and this and the one one and the two two, but you miss out two of these points and you can check quickly and should check because it's not bad to check that this is not a closed embed. Okay, and then if you want to see, you understand that if you understand this, I would redo this if y is just a point. So the map from x to a point is also doesn't have the diagonal is not a closed embedding; it's locally closed. And so if you understand that, you really understand not non-separated things, even though you don't know what separated means. I accept you do because I'm just telling you right now. Okay, so uh, great. So something is separated or house door. If the diagonal map, a morphism is separated or house door. If the diagonal map is a closed embedding, not just a locally closed embedding. So for example. Maps of at rings, maps of affines are separated, projective space is separated, monomorphisms are separated because the diagonal map is an isomorphism, if you remember. And then the bad guy, uh, the line with the doubled origin is not separated. And the value of criterion of separatedness, which I'm not going to tell you, um, roughly says that this is the only way in which things are not separated because you have somehow two limit points. Uh, uh, they're like two, two, you have a nice one parameter families that have two limits, not one. So in some sense, this seemingly pathological example, if you understand this one example, you understand fully how things can fail to be separated. Okay, so now I think, I hope you would expect the fact that if I define a class of morphisms, that uh, they are gonna be well-behaved. In other words, that they should be preserved by fiber product, two separate morphisms should compose, and you can check separatedness if x to y is separated by just checking on an open cover of y. So that's true, but let me explain why soon because I'd rather do it as a part of a whole bunch of types of morphisms. Okay, but once we do that, once we have shown this, which we've not, then you'll know that affine morphisms are separated because uh, locally they look like maps of affines to affines. Projective A schemes are separated because a projective A scheme was constructed, it was something which we perhaps I think saw were closed embeddings inside projective space over A. Closed embeddings are separated and uh, projective space is separated. So we win there too. Uh, and so now if you, have a, if you have maps from X to Y and Y to Z and the composition is separated, then I claim so is pi. So now here's the cancellation theorem. Uh, so what I'm saying is I should have put arrowheads. Great. I'm saying that if this is separated, uh, then this must be separated. You can like just cancel out, off uh, that part and it's gonna remain separated. Why is it true? Well, this is separated. What we, to, to apply the cancellation theorem, we need to check this is separated and the diagonal morphism is separated. But the diagonal morphism is a locally closed embedding and locally closed embeddings are separated, they're monomorphisms. So therefore that, that hypothesis comes for free. 
So it, it, this is like easier to think about knowing the cancellation theorem than, to real, than by using facts about separators. So then, okay, great, here's another one. So if you have something where, uh, it, so now if this is separated and this is a closed embedding, then therefore this is a closed embedding. And why is that true? Uh, it, I mean, when you say it this way and you parse what it means, it sounds confusing, but the answer is just because that's a closed embedding and the diagonal is closed embedding, that's what separated means. Therefore that's a closed embedding. So once you did that, once you did the cancellation theorem, you are that, like, you're, that's great. And now comes something I would like to spend more time on than I will, which is, uh, which is the reduced to separated theorem. So, rough, so here's what it's about, but I'll let you ponder it. And actually one of you has, uh, one of you has uh, made a good, a good question on Zulip about this as well. So I'm gonna talk about when I have two morphisms from X to Y, I'm gonna ask when they're the same, the locus where they're the same. Uh, what does that even mean? Well, first I should say what it means for two morphisms to be the same, because two morphisms are the, uh, two, two, so two, two morphisms the same doesn't just mean that the points, that they're the same morphism on the level of points. This is something that is scheme theoretic. So there, it is something richer. So then what do you mean by the locus where two things are the same? Well, I'm going to answer the question almost functorially, but then it's going to be a sub locus and sub, sub scheme where they're the same. So the locus where two morphisms are the same, I claim uh, uh, is going to be satisfy universal property. So if you have two morphisms from uh, two morphisms from X to Y, I claim and I have that, that there's going to be some beautiful thing inside it that's going to be locally closed embedding so that any time you have a map to X that such that the two morphisms to Y are the same, the compositions are the same, then it must factor through uniquely this locally closed embedding. So uh, that because I'm defining it in a universal property sort of way, that means if it's it, that means that so long as I can produce it, it's going to be unique. And then that really deserves the name of the locus where the morphisms are the same. And then I claim what that is, is something which is just you map X to Y cross Y by those two morphisms. You have the map to the first X is by F to the second by Y. And then you, ha and you have the diagonal map. And I claim that this fiber product uh, is going to be this locus. And it is by definition, literally the maps to this thing are those maps to X such that the maps to y, the, the two ways of mapping to y, you get the same thing. So if you parse what that means, you get that this is a fiber product, but this is all, the diagonal map is always a locally closed embedding. So the locus where they agree is always a locally closed embedding. And if, so even better, and this is where the reduced to separatedness, the separated theorem comes, uh, uh, that it is going to be a, um, that the, that the uh, if x, if y is, actually separated, it means that this is a closed embedding, which means the locus where they agree is a closed embedding. And if X is reduced, then any closed embedding in a reduced thing is exactly the same data as a closed subset. So the reduced to separated theorem says that the locus of a, a where we have two morphisms from a reduced to a separated thing, uh, that, that uh, they must agree on a closed subset. And that's just, that is just a, it falls directly out of what we're what we're saying, and maybe I should say you might wonder what it, when I said why is separated, and I I guess always I've said morph morphisms are separated, so I must mean that there's like a morphism to something maybe spec C, uh, and I really should put the separated there, but that's just translating from English into growth and speak. Robbie, you have, uh, you have open written on your slide instead of closed. Ah yes, uh, is uh, thank you. That's good. I meant to do that to see if I can cash people. No, that's actually this. <laughs> okay, no, I, uh, <laughs> no yeah, well, I caught me. Great, okay, good. So now let me show you that separated morphisms really are well-behaved. And now comes the, the, the epiphany that one has at some point when you learn about these things, which is that lots of reasonable notions of morphisms you could describe as properties of the diagonal of that morphism. So uh, some are, so, so some, I just made a definition that separated 
means that the diagonal is a closed embedding. Uh, and similarly, uh, I could reinterpret my quasi-separated definition. The better version is that the diagonal is quasi-compact. The notion of a monomorphism, earlier on we said that's exactly the same as a diagonal being an isomorphism. There's a notion which we haven't said, um, which really deserves a bit, well, no, I like, actually, I like the name, the notion of affin diagonal. You often, and it's a hypothesis that often turns up in theorems uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you have an affine diagonal or a slight variation of quasi-affine diagonal. And that's, and what is, a, what is an affine diagonal morphism? It's a case where the diagonal is affine. That's, that's why that's a good name. Uh, and then you could take, if you are one of these judicial people and you like universally injective morphisms, that means that the diagonal map is surjective. And that just means surjective if you remember just on points, nothing fancy. And so in general, you have things where, uh, if you have a, something about the diagonal, a property of the diagonal, you can find a new kind of morphism called the p-diagonal, just in an analogy with affine diagonal, that says that's defined in terms of the diagonal having property p. So separated should be called closed embedding diagonal, but that's a bit unwieldy. Quasi-separated should be quasi-compact diagonal, and I think it should be called that because I think that's a reasonable thing. Um, I think affine diagonal should be called affine diagonal. Monomorphism should not be called isomorphism diagonal, I, I guess. And universal, yeah, okay. Well, sometimes you get something that's not. But, but, the, but the reason I want to say this is that if you start with a well-behaved class of morphisms, then the, 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 the children of this, uh, I guess the, there's one child sharing the same genetic material. So it's like some that, terrible metaphor, but uh, if you get a class of morphisms, uh, you get the, you get the, uh, the, the corresponding fancier class also is beha behaves nicely. And because closed embeddings behave nicely, quasi-compact isomorphisms, affines, and surjectivity behave nicely. Therefore, for free, all of these behave nicely. They, by behave nicely, I mean preserved by base change. You can, they're local on the target, compose them, and once you have those three, they, you have your cancellation theorem uh, preserved by products in various ways. So, um, so let's just prove it so you can see why it's true. And I'm just going to do it semi, because this is di these are necessarily diagram chases, I'm going to diagram chase freely, uh, but it's the sort of thing where you watch someone diagram chase and it's not even like you admire their finesse. You just have no idea what they're doing, uh, but then you hopefully can go and do it yourself. Um, great. So the ones that follow from it, we've already talked about why they follow from it. So uh, great. So let's just ask the various questions. So here's, uh, so we're assuming that th this property P, uh, that these behave nicely and we want to show the diagonal things behave nicely. So we already know that if we have a, a fiber diagram, uh, then, uh, and the bottom has P, then so does the top. Uh, we also know that the local, well, actually the local nature is a different I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then the composition one says, if you have two things with P, then the composition would be P. So what do we need to prove? And I'm doing this to show you that it's not hard. Um, so if you have, so the statement is this, if you have a fiber diagram and you know the bottom is, the, uh, is a P diagonal morphism. So in other words, this diagonal map has P. And the question is, why does the top have P? And so you want to somehow get that morphism somehow. And how do you get it? Well, where did the bottom come from? You have to draw this diagram because that's, that's what that's all about. And you want this and you also have this. So I, I, I think there's nothing you could possibly do, but take the fiber product of over Z uh, of, let's see, of, wait, uh, sorry, that's the arrow's going the wrong way, over Y of this entire thing. And then you get above it, you get a W, W, W cross C, W, and W. And then you have maps of all the things on the right to the corresponding things on the left. And the important thing is that this means that in consequence, the one you cared about, the map from W to W to cross W over Z is the base chain. This is a fiber diagram. This is a parallelogram. Uh, and so that's a fiber diagram. So in other words, because this guy had P, this guy had P and we've just won. So we've used base change and yeah, I think just base change. The so base change here implies base change here and abstract nonsense. Now composition, how'd you do that? Well, given two morphisms X to Y to Z, if you know that this diagonal has P and that diagonal has P, why does this diagonal have P? Well, how do you get this in terms of these? You are just led to this thing, which um, to the magic diagram. Uh, so there's the diagonal map 
of there is the let me highlight the ones that are that are in p so that you have the diagonal map of y that's in p so well, that's a little bit too big and by base change that's in p we also are assuming what else are we assuming oh it's like yeah so we know that and we're also assuming that x to x cross y is in p and we are also assuming that it's closed under that p is superior by composition and bingo we won so using base change and composition uh, we get composition of the of the p diagonal so we've won and maybe the last thing is this local nature uh you the fact that you can check something as p locally on the target but you construct the diag you construct the you construct the fiber product locally on the target too so if you just parse what that means uh it's 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 uh that's cheap and doesn't use the other two it's a separate thing great so that means for sure separated quasi separated i always found it if you try to prove cold why uh, which one of the various properties of quasi separated morphism separated or can be very confusing to prove, but now they just fall out. Okay. Um, actually, before I get to proper, I meant to uh, let me first add a page to finally define something which uh, uh, you should have wanted me to define. You did. People complained, people sent me hate mail. Uh, what the notion of a of a algebraic variety is, and let me tell you um, uh, the def uh, So really, the definition, the reasonable definition, is the following thing. And the only reason we waited this long is we didn't know what Hausdorff meant. Is that you you start you know the notion of M spec, and then you know uh, and, and so with M spec, uh, the uh, and th this works for uh, rings that have no nil potents that are finally generated over your base field. That's this over an algebraically closed field. Uh, so you have rings that are fine gen generated over your algebraically closed field that have no nil potents. And then you could produce an M spec and then you can glue them together to get something which uh, 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 you, you, could, you could define a variety to be something, a ring space that's locally like this. And now I'll just toss in Hausdorff. Sorry, separated. And that's my definition. You might say, "Why did I put in separated?" And I'll say, "Go back and ask your manifold. Go ask back and ask your manifold professor." Uh, and so that's the definition. So all I did just added that in. But I do also want to say that if you are, if you're thinking simultaneously in terms of schemes, uh, the definition of variety you might take would be something different, which is it's going to be uh, a finite. Uh, so X is a variety. And this is, uh, when I say these are the same definition, I must mean something slightly subtle because they're not word for word the same uh, over K if uh, uh, X is finite type. Oh, I should have say, should, ah, okay, sorry. I forgot something in this definition. Wait, okay, finite type means locally, it looks like spec of K adjoined finite many variables mod some ideal. And it's also quasi compact. And that's the thing here where you want to glue together finitely many of these because otherwise it's infinite and then you get confused. So you want to be able, a variety of something, you're, you're, uh, traditionally you just cover, you need finitely many of these affines glued together in some way and you want it to be house dwarf. Uh, and so, you, uh, so quasi compact, it should be reduced because I, we want no nil potents and it should be separated. And have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. So I could say in a very painful way that it's a finite type, which includes quasi-compact. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a finite type reduced separated scheme over K. And so why do that? Well, now if K is not algebraically closed, it still makes sense. That's useful. You can get rid of reducedness if you want to or separatedness. So anyway, it's a, it's a definition. But just to parse the definition, be really clear, fi uh, this part means it's geometric. It looks locally like things cut out in space. This part, the quasi-compact means it's, there are not too many of these complicated pieces. Uh, reduced means you don't want any fuzz. And separated this means you want it to be house store. So it's completely reasonable even if it sounds fancy. Okay, so now let me, let me end with talking about proper morphisms. And so proper morphisms, uh, this is the, uh, so a proper, uh, this generalizes the notion of roughly speaking, oh, I, let me actually write something down. Uh, like a compact variety, let's say over C, 
because otherwise I don't know what compact means. Uh, that's, that's the thing which becomes proper. And the image of something compact is compact. That we'll have an analogous statement like that. Um, so this is a relative version of, of compact varieties. Uh, so you should think the morphism uh, is proper if somehow it's all the fibers are, are, are proper. So think maybe compact, and or may also think the notion of proper map in topology. And I always forget what the definition is. So uh, great. So here's uh, in topology, but in here's my here's my definition, not my definition. Here's everyone's definition of a proper morphism. So it's proper if it's finite type. So think geometric, separated. Think geometric and uh, universally closed, not just closed. And so everything I think is reasonable here in this definition, because this makes it kind of geometric. We're talking about families of varieties. Uh, uh, that's the way to think about it. Uh, and closed makes sense, because in the definition of proper in the usual sense, that's a closed map. Why do I say universally closed? And um, the, the answer is, in retrospect, uh, very reasonable. So it's, um, so, right, finite type means geometric, separated means Hausdorff, and closed. So th here's the issue. That if you take the, uh, the it's that the Zariski topology is really bad. And for example, the map from A1 to a point, that's a closed map because the image of a closed subset in A1 is a closed subset in point of a point. But and so and this is also separated in finite type. But that is not what we want. The the complex number should not be is not compact. Uh, uh, in well, it it is in the Zariski topology, but that's the wrong topology. So, but if instead you require that it's universally closed, and this is a worthwhile thing to try to figure out, that's no longer proper. So that's one reason. Another reason is because this, I want this to be, anytime I define a bunch of morphisms, you already know I will very soon always say, this is a well-behaved class of morphisms. And so what do I need to check? Uh, so I claim it's true because finite type is well-behaved. We don't check that earlier because that was well-behaved, that was well-behaved. Separated is well-behaved. We just talked about why that was true. And closed is not well-behaved. It's true that closed is local. It's also true that it's preserved by composition, but it's not preserved by base change. That's, uh, uh, and again, to have that example, uh, you'll, an example is gonna come from, uh, from this. So I will deliberately not tell it to you. So it, it, so it fails if I, just, if I got, didn't have closed here, it would not be a well-behaved class of morphisms. And so what do I do? Well, I don't give up. I just stupidly require that it's closed after all base changes. And then by definition, this is preserved by base change. So universally closed means every base change, after any base change, uh, it's closed. Uh, and so that may solve lots of problems. It got rid of A1 and it uh, also made this a well-behaved class of morphisms. Okay, but then once you have this definition, uh, then you can quickly check a bunch of things that roughly speaking, and this is in the notes, so I won't say it precise, I won't give the correct statement, uh, the precise statement, but the image of a proper is always proper. Secondly, you can check that projective, things that are projective, you should think of as you want them to be compact, and they are indeed, they are proper. That will, however, use something from next week, which is the fundamental theorem of elimination theory. So, uh, so modulo that, we know this. Uh, so assuming you know something you don't know, then you know something else you don't know. Uh, and then again, now there's this issue that A1 is not proper and is worth doing because you can get your hands dirty. It's finite, it's, oh, not finite. It's finite, it's finite type separated and close. Okay, so let me end by showing you uh, something uh, uh, by reinterpreting the analog of something from complex analysis. So something you might remember if, if you've taken complex analysis is that if you have a complex manifold, there's the maximum principle, which basically says the value at a point is the average all the, well, that's not quite the maximum principle. Some, some principle in complex analysis is that if you have a holomorphic function, the value at a point is kind of the average of the things around it. And that means that it can't, that it can't be, like if it's the average of these, it can't be the only way it could be greater than or equal to everything on that circle is if everything on the circle were the same. So this means that any holomorphic function uh, can't have a local maximum without it being constant. And so if it's, uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's a closed complex manifold, then the only 
uh, for the only functions are constant. The only global functions, homework functions are constant. And so this is the, from the notion of the maximum principle. We don't know complex analysis, so forget that. But the analog is that the only functions on, and this is better, uh, uh, that, well, in some ways it's better. Uh, the only functions on connected complex projective varieties are the constants. Actually, and now, uh, so, that, so now all we need is connected. It doesn't have to be smooth. Uh, in particular, because we don't even know what smooth means yet. Uh, but we know what a variety is, then we know what projective is. Actually, uh, uh, well, we sort of, well, okay, let me give the actual statement, which is if you have a connected, reduced proper scheme over a field, and the field's algebraically closed, then the only functions are the constants. So that is the complete, that's the general th version where you have nothing about dimension or smoothness or anything like that. But we are gonna use each of these things. Okay, so here's the thing we want to prove. Uh, I just repeated it there. And so say you have a function on your, uh, a function on X, where X is this very nice thing. Now the function gives you a map to A1. Uh, so, or uh, for many, many reasons, uh, you can think about that translation. For example, a map to an affine is the same as a map of global section. Well, let me, given a, given a function, you, that's exactly the same data as a map to A1. Now, F is proper. How do I know F is proper? Well, because F is a map. Uh, uh, so how do I know F is proper? Well, X to spec C is proper. And so by the cancellation theorem, so this is separated, meaning that the diagonal is a closed embedding, which means that uh, and closed embeddings are all proper. So this is not proper, but it is, proper diagonal, has a proper diagonal, and those it's separated. And so by the cancellation theorem, this therefore is proper. So we're good, we've, we've used that. And it's proper, which means that the image is, is proper, it's closed. So it's a closed subset of A1. And it's also because the image of something connected is connected and the scheme theoretic, theoretic image of something reduced is reduced, um, then uh, we know it's a closed connected reduced sub, uh, sub scheme in A1. I actually, I, and I could have just done that to P1. Let me stick A1 inside P1. And of course, X maps the A1 part, but I get a map to P1. And so the image is a closed, connected, reduced subscheme of P1. And it's not all of P1 because it can't be infinity. Like it only it lies inside A1. And if you think about what the closed, connected, reduced subschemes of A1 are, of spec K join T, uh, where K is algebraically closed, it's just a point. Uh, in other words, it's like T minus A. And if you parse what that means, the image being a point means that uh, the scheme theoretic image being a point means that when you pull back any this function T minus A back to X, you must get zero. In other words, the function T is, uh, or F must be, uh, 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 the function F minus A must be zero. In other words, right, the image being a point, the fact that maps to A1 correspond exactly to functions must mean that F is constant. And I find the best way to understand this argument, this proof, or to really understand it in your gut is to really see where you use each of these hypotheses. Uh, so if you get rid of connected, where does it break down? Uh, and that's not too hard to see. Uh, if, if you get rid of reduced, it's kind of interesting. And if you get rid of proper, if it's A1 instead, that's interesting. And maybe if you get rid of algebraically closed, you also get something interesting because you have something which is almost constant, almost deserves what well, is somehow constant, but it's not, yeah, it's worth thinking about. So right, so that proof looked really, really different than the complex analysis where there's no maximum principle, but it is one of these finiteness. There's this sort of sense in mathematics where you, in geometry maybe, where you have something which when you have a compactness in the geometric problem you're talking about, you get some vector space, which could have been infinite, like on A1, the space of functions infinite dimensional, uh, the, the space of variables, uh, of polynomials in one variable for the complex numbers is infinite dimensional. But when you have something proper or compact, it's one dimensional. Great. So let me say where we are and where we're going last few minutes. Uh, so at this point, uh, I, I want to, so in, in the notes, now we're going to go backwards a little bit uh, and, talk, uh, and talk about images of morphisms uh, and what this means and the questions you should have in mind are the, are the following sorts of things. The first is that if you were to take 
a map of one variety to another, what does the set theoretic image look like? And that's not a question you would ask before because you didn't know what a variety is. But imagine, but let me rephrase it in a way that you would have done it, you would have understood before, which is you have some thing in n space. Uh, this is the same reason why we care about image and linear algebra as well. You take something in n space and maybe you solve some equations uh, and you wonder when they have a common solution. That can be restated as a word question about image as well. Or another thing is if you take, if you map, uh, if you map, here's a question, if you map C2 to C5 in some way, is the image closed or not? And the answer is, it doesn't have to be, it could be something slightly weird. So that Chevalier's theorem will say that the images are constructible. Uh, and then another thing is the projective implies proper, which we, I mentioned before, but really the statement is classical elimination theory where it's, where it's like, if I give you, um, let me put it this way, if I have three, if, uh, if I have, this relates to the question maybe I asked a long time ago near the start, uh, if I give you 25 equations in uh, five unknowns, uh, uh, but I don't tell you what the coefficients are, they're like they're formal variables. What are the conditions for them to have a common zero if I give you the degrees? And the answer is this, you should expect that there should be some polynomial relation that will tell you that. That's the, the, that always happens in every example you basically think of. And that's what we'll basically be able to prove next time. And to be honest, that, that, that's gonna be something you could have done before if you said it the right way. And then various other classical geometric things we can say. So my, my intent next time as a concluding pseudo lecture isn't to um, tell you a host of things that will completely motivate everything we've done so far. It's gonna instead be a host of things that will uh, that will be examples of the things you can do, but the machinery being set up is certainly way too big for these smaller things. Uh, and it's being set up for, uh, for uh, much more ambitious, it was set up for much more ambitious uses as well. And maybe you'll have some inkling about, uh, about why it's so powerful. Okay, so now uh, we are at the end of the hour. So shall we, uh, pause for some general questions and then we'll officially end and then I can stay for less official questions. Too. So I will also turn on Zulip, but I'm gonna let the shepherd potentially Oh, actually David All right, great. Ah, okay, David Mullen had a good question, but then Jonathan, yeah, right, so Jonathan already answered that, so that is good. All right, we are back. Um, should I just shoot? Yes, fire away. Okay, so one thing, um, uh, so there's, I don't know where to start. Um, so, one thing that I thought of uh, was uh, there's a certain class of morphisms, so finite morphisms are um, a good example. So, but I was trying to remember that there's like affine plus proper is, f that's not quite finite because you can have closed immersions, right? But isn't there a way to get finite as? Um... No, actually affine plus proper is finite. So the- But can so... you have a closed, because closed immersions are affine, but they're also- And, they are, and they're and finite they're not... too. Oh, they're fine. Okay, then they are finite too. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so what, so what, what Taylor is saying is that finite morphisms, which were, let me just define uh, what they were. Finite morphisms, they are defined to be, well, they're affine morphisms. Oh, we can't see your writing. We can't see your writing right now. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you caught that. Now you can, right? Uh, yeah. Nope. Good. Uh, they're affine morphisms plus a bit more. And so, so the affine morphisms, that means locally, they look like spec A to spec B. And now I just want that, in other words, they look like ring maps. I want A to be a finitely generated B module, or I guess they would call in the French sense, a finite B module. That's a B, a FG, finitely generated B module. And then the uh, finite morphisms are, this, are affine and uh, proper. And now why are they affine and proper? Well, they're affine because I just told you they were. 
And why are they proper? Well, they are separated because alpha morphisms are separated. They're finite type because that they're, that requires that you be able to say things that should be finally generated as an algebra, and they're even finally generated as a module. Um, and they're and why, why are they universally closed? Well, they're clo you can check that finite morphisms are closed. And because finite morphisms are preserved by base change, they stay finite morphisms and they stay closed. So you get universally closed. So this direction is, is, are things you can easily describe. The other direction can be more complicated. Um, yeah, this, this comes up in Diophantine geometry a lot. So like the proof right. of Mann and Mumford is, uh, yeah. so one of the proofs of Mann and Mumford, right? So these are like, when you try and prove finite risk results, this is, right. So you prove two things are affine and proper, and then you end up, and this is, this is one of the ways that you end up showing that you have say a finite number of rational points or a finite number, you know, we haven't talked about so, Jacobians yet, but you know, you have a curve, so, you get inside is Jacobian. And, so the way, you get, the way you get the other direction is not so bad, but it requires epsilon, or maybe square root epsilon more than we know, which is if you have a morphism and it's affine, and it's proper, then you can recover. So you have your sheaf of functions on X uh, and you have your sheaf of functions on Y and you could push forward the functions on X into Y. And that's the, this thing is the thing which looks like your spec A. So you can recover your spec A by that push forward. And so if you only knew that for proper morphisms, when you push forward, you get a finitely generated, a finite module, finitely generated module. And this is very much of the flavor of the last example I gave where I said the functions are finitely generated, or a finite dimensional, well, I didn't say that. Uh, I said, uh, they're only the constants. But if you start relaxing things, you get finite, finite dimensional vector space, finitely generated as a module. So the generalization is uh, of that is exactly this. And this is, uh, this is, uh, growth index coherence theorem. So once you have this fact, which is a like amazing, once you have this fact, which is a completely believable, uh, would have been believable when he proved it fact, uh, then you've proved it that these are that finite equals affine plus proper, but you do need this finite, you do need this uh, theme in mathematics of things that are relatively compact. Compactness gives finiteness, that's the, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's another characterization of closed. Uh, well, uh, there was another characterization of closed immersion via um, via global spec. So I think what is it? You can uh, right. So it, it's just a surjection of right. So x to y. How do you know it's a closed? Uh, how well, how do you know it's a closed embedding? Well, you well. I guess the it's, it's the, I think it's the, the push forward looks like O mod I and then right. uh, but the complication in that is that you really the what makes life so much easier is if you knew in advance it was an affine morphism. Yeah. Because then the push forward it just looks like spec A to spec B. And otherwise you have to prove it's an affine morphism somehow. Uh, and then you could say, oh that then I all I mean is that this ring map is surjective. So surjective affine means closed embedding. Finite as a module means uh, finite morphism. Um, what, other, what other things are worth saying? Those are the best kinds of affine morphism. Yeah, but I think another thing to point out is that you can, so being surjective on stocks is not enough, right? To characterize just being a, a, a closed map, right? Because locally you, closed things, I guess, are also surjective on stocks, but they're not, necessarily closed uh, embedded right under the pullback right so you could say i guess you're saying if you have x to y and you now but the problem is there are words we don't know yet which is on stocks um now we I do have stock we do yeah we know stocks so yes so what you're saying is you might think well except you wouldn't because open embeddings would uh so you have an open embedding and the, uh, of x into y there's x inside y and then the stocks on y uh, give you are isomorphic for the stocks on X. And now if you have a closed embedding, the stocks on Y surject onto the stocks on X. And so if you combine the two, they're still going to surject. And so hence locally closed embeddings. But then you might ask, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the only thing that can happen. But then I'll get you again 
by taking spec of any localization. And that's neither, that if I take a random localization at a prime, that's not a closed embedding or an open embedding. Yeah. And yet on stocks, it's an isomorphism. Yeah. So that so that makes you feel sad. Um, so this is an example of this is why I want to call this a sub. I mean, I it's think not a sub closed versus locally closed is pretty tricky. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is another one. So we've been talking about locally blah plus quasi compact is blah, right? Yes. Right. And so how does this fit but in the situation here? Locally blah uh, plus quasi compact equals blah. Right. And this is not a this is unfortunately this is a uh, not a foolproof thing to do. So uh, uh, and similarly universally, actually this one is better. Universally yeah. blah, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, equals blah after any base change. That's always true. I think I should be very careful. But but uh, in the but, first... but locally blah. It's that's not, there are exact counter examples to that. But we don't talk about this in one in terms of closed right. So so the definition for Closed immersion is not locally blah plus quasi compact is equal to at least that's not the way we state it. And that's right, exactly. Yeah. It's not that, uh, and that's because locally closed got inherited from locally closed. The, the, the unit locally closed came from topology. We yeah. didn't take closed and then did the algebra geometric thing. And didn't add it. Yeah, exactly. So locally, it's simply locally ring space is not. Uh, yeah, so they're unfortunately we're locally, but at least it's reasonable in the sense. Uh, uh, so so okay, okay. Locally closed comes from no, because you still have closed for locally ring spaces. That is, but 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 in points of topology, you could talk about a locally closed subset. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and that's the thing which got yeah, and that's somehow cognitively prior to locally. Uh, okay, that's uh, to, where yeah. All right. Um, uh, so we, so one thing I wrote down, but you, you already addressed was this equalizers perspective of separatedness. Um, right. so, um, so maybe one thing I will say about separatedness that I want to sort of emphasize that I think, uh, is, I mean, what emphasizes absolutely not original because it's going back to the, going back to the original that the, the way you prove separateness is not the value of criterion. If you look in EGA, that's not, uh, to show projective space is separated, you just, you can just do it. And we just did it. And I and I am just doing what Sarah or Dune or Rothnig or whoever did it, did it first. It's, a, it, it's something, it's sort of, you shouldn't treat it like high technology. It's actually low technology that you can use high technology to do fancy, later on, the value criterion is really useful, but just not to show that projective space is, uh, is, is, yeah. And Jonathan knows I'm going to say that. I disagree yeah. with this one, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, use, uh, I, 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 I actually like the value of criterion too a lot. So I like the, I like <laughs> the value of criterion too, but, 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 but there's no way, let me put it this way. I could not have proved projective space was separated today without, uh, uh, I mean, really prove not just quoting a fact in algebra without getting into some valuation theory, uh, without getting into discrete value. I mean, uh, it, it would at least not be possible to prove it so quickly. Yeah. Um, Can we look at your proof again? Because it looked sure. like so you, you, you showed that, that it was locally closed. Then how did we get the closeness again? So here's, here's the proof. And again, I really want to say this is, you know, this really... I think it's even an EGA, like it's like a first, uh, and EGA has no examples. So, you know, almost no, so the fact that if, you know, if, if Grothny can do this, then, you know, with deal with actual rings and trajections, and surely we can as well. Uh, uh, so the, so I mean, <laughs> his first instinct was not to functorialize it first. He functorialized it second. I mean, uh, so, so yeah, let, let's do P1. And so to show that, let's show P1 is separated. Well, what, what I need it, I take P1 inside P1 cross P1, and P1 is covered by two open sets, U0 and U1. So yeah. the product is covered by four open sets. And now this is somewhat, hopefully you see what I mean by this. Like uh, maybe I'm better to do this in four different colors. So there's one open set. Uh, there is another one. There is another one. And let me put, uh, how about uh, green for this one? 
and there is the fourth. So I want to show P1 is close, the map to this is close as a closed embedding, right? So mm -hmm. all I need to do is show you that over any each one of these four open sets, the uh, it's a closed embedding into there. That's local, right? I and mean, that's that's what. Okay, and really of the four, okay, let me do let me do the uh, black one. The black one is u not cross u not, and so there the map. The pre-image in P1 is U0. So it's U0 mapping U0 cross U0. So that's affine goes to affine cross affine. That one we already showed. That okay, so you're doing it for all the sets. You're not just doing it for the diagonal, the thing that covers the diagonal. The that's the point. only difference. Exactly. The only difference okay. is there's one other kind of set. And it's not a hard kind of set. Okay, uh, so it looked to me for a second that you were like, you were only checking that it was locally closed. But because right. you're doing the whole thing, you're actually, it's, it's another descent, I guess, maybe. Uh, yes, but it's a very, uh, so I, but the way I think about this is how do you know it's locally, I, I mean, I, I think it's an important statement that all morphisms, diagonal morphisms are locally closed and it's not a hard, that was not a hard yeah, statement. Yeah, that was, this is one of the things that, that, that I think is, is, you know, you go and you try and sit down and you do it for the first, I remember this doing this for the first time and being like, well, isn't everything closed because you you have you know you write it down and you're like oh i have an ideal and like it looks like it's a quasi coherent sheaf of ideals and you know uh i, I just remember when i when i sat down yeah, with so, for the first time it was yep it's really <laughs> and then you and then you realize you're missing right when you do that you're missing these two points yeah uh, and that's sort of exactly where the line with the doubled origin uh if you mix this in is going to cause right exactly and then to show so it's a closed embedding here it, i mean what is a morphism of schemes if not a map of rings locally right that's that, that's uh well maybe that's the question whether you think of it that way is, or not but it's uh but you but i think it is uh uh some people would much rather say forget the affine well I, I just see no way no way of forgetting the affine because you have to talk about schemes. No, you want to write everything down. That's the easiest way to prove anything is to right exactly right. So you shouldn't be ashamed of yourself for doing that. Yeah. Uh, and then if it's a map of affines and it's an affine map of affines you can write down, why not write it down? And then this rejection is really obvious. And then, but then you're done, and then you haven't had a chance to even look up the value criteria, look up what evaluation ring is yet. I mean, I I I, I love the value criterion. But not for this. Like I just don't. I mean, seeing the proof of this way. This is the. I might have said this in an earlier pseudo lecture that that you have math made difficult again, where you you uh, is a good thing. And I feel like I get insight about the value criterion for separatedness and properness. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think value criterion properness, showing projective space is proper in that way, not using elimination theory. Yeah, that to me is like that's L'Hopital's rule. I think Michael Thaddeus told me this. Uh, this, Wait, uh, the violative criterion of properness is L'Hopital's rule? What? Applied to projective space. Like essentially, how do you know that when you map, take a valuation ring and you map it to projective space, how do you know you can like, fill in the central fiber? Let me, so for the audience who doesn't know what I I'm talking I have never heard L'Hopital's rule, this L'Hopital's rule thing. Okay, so it's, uh, so so you, let me map, let me take a, uh, let me take a polynomial ring. Let's let me go ahead. Oh no, you're good. You're good. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I want to be. Yeah. So the, let's take a, let's take um, C join T, but I want to localize at T. So I have like a little. Now we know to picture this. This is a one over C, and there's like a little germ, uh, well, a, a germ, a little shred of the complex numbers. And let's try to map it to P. Let's get fancy. P three. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, and so we know what this the the scheme looks like. It's like it's like there's the closed point, and then there's the generic point. And maybe if you want, think about this in terms of actual polynomial rings, and just don't worry about poles elsewhere. And so now let's check quote the value criterion of properness. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're gonna check. We have a map from the generic point. So I need to give you a bunch of a point in P three. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you some rational functions in T, T squared over four, T nineteenth over T plus one over T to the fourteenth. Uh, okay, so uh, four, <laughs> and, and and great. So I so I uh, so I maybe it's not going to look like Lopital's rule right now. So let me yeah let me make that 
uh, t to the 14th in the numerator. How's that? Not yeah. divided by zero. Not divided by zero is bad. Uh, divided by something. And so, yeah, now I'm putting t there. And now I try to map it to projective space using these functions. And when t is not zero, I know what's going on. But when t is equal to zero, I don't know what point to, I plug in t equals zero, I get zero, 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 zero. Mm -hmm. And now I think, oh no, what, what will I do? Well, I need to take the limit as t goes to, t goes to zero. Uh, and I wanna get these ratios in the limit. So what do I do when I do that? I can just divide, I can, I guess I can cancel out the t's or I can take the derivatives or I could do, and if I said take the derivatives, that's L'Hopital's rule. Uh, or if I said divide by the t's, that's, mm. um, and so I do that, I say, okay, I realize I get zero, 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 but if I divide all these by t, then these three still stay divisible by t, but that one is not. And so therefore the limit is zero, 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 one. And how do I know that's the only limit possible? Actually, now I can use a reduced to separated theorem. The reduced to separated theorem says that the map for something reduced to something separated, and that's separated, and that was reduced. Uh, two maps agree uh, uh, on a closed subset. So if they agree on a dense open subset, they must agree everywhere. The limit is unique. Sorry, can you make the statement of this reduced separated? Sorry, I didn't catch that part. Sure, uh, so it, the statement, is that is the following? Uh, okay, so here's the here's what we proved. Although telegraphically, let me zoom in so I can write more neatly. But you could still so see for the separate. uninitiated, the evaluative criteria is about lifting things, maps from the generic point, you know, right. up up. So, and I should say, if you're uninitiated, they're probably already not on your side because they don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, and, o and only when they only when they learn what you're talking about more, then they'll be convinced and be on your side. But then I want, uh, but, but like you're, you're not making it easier when you have to define it in terms of two I, things that are not. Uh, uh, right. So this is no fuzz. <laughs> and this is, so this is, so reduced is not a hard concept. And Hausdorff is not too hard, or at least we think. Uh, so, so what's the statement? We have, uh, let me say it one way, that if you have, Two, uh, two maps from X to Y, then the statement is if they, and this X is reduced mm -hmm. and Y is separated, then the way I said it was the locus where they agree forms a closed subset of X. Oh, the a equalizer, way to say it, yeah. Equal, yeah. Exactly, this is, the equalizer, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so hence, if they agree on a dense open subset, they agree everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that means that if this is spec of a DVR, what it means is that the limit is unique. Like if you take all, if you want that easy depth, that's okay, like the so easy they agree, direction. If we had a dense open, then the set where they agree is closed. So then it's open and closed. So then it's everywhere. Exactly. All right. And you need X to be reduced. And you, okay, because okay, you're using the open and closed thing for the, that's that's where you're using the reducedness. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, so that's why the, I mean, it is true. And that's the easy direction. I mean, that is the, uh, 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 that's the really useful part of the value of criteria. So sorry. And then like, can I just go back and see how you applied this? Sure. And so now we're going to, we're going to show that for projective space, that whenever you map, uh, yeah, let's, show, let's show the value of criterion of, okay, let's show the, the value, let's prove the value of criterion of properties for projective space. Okay. Uh, and so it's got two parts. So you have a spec of a discrete valuation ring. So that's got two points. It's got like the closed point and the generic point. Is that a good name for them? Uh, and, yeah. uh, and now we have a map from the generic point to projective space. And I claim that there's exactly one way to extend it uh, to a map from, that there is one way and only one way to extend it. And so he's doing proper, by the way, for everybody, he's doing proper over a point. So. Yes, that's, thank you. That's a very important point there. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's over spec K, that matters. Um, great. And so how do I know there's one and a most one way of doing it? Well, how do I know there's a most one? I know there's a most one by the reduced to separated theorem. Mm -hmm. How do I know there's at least one? Well, I just, this is a field. This is spec of a field of the fraction field. So I just and I know I, what, what what's a map of this field to projective space. Yeah. You just it so, just you just write down a bunch of things in the field, and yeah. then you just check what, what's the valuation of each of these things. And if they're all 
uh, and there are a bunch of integers, the valuations. And so then you multiply or divide by the uniformizer so as to make all the valuations non-negative and one of them should have valuation zero. There's your, that's it. We've proved, we proved the, so, and that, that's the, if you want that's L'Hopital's. Well, yeah, maybe it's a, it could be L'Hopital's rule, but I never want, I don't want to take the derivative. I much would much prefer to take the, just clear denominators. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that proves the validator criteria. So that's the easy direction of the validator criterion of properness because we've shown it's, it satisfies it. But now the hard direction is if it satisfies this for all DDRs mm -hmm. um, and it's finite type, uh, then the resulting thing is uh, proper. And so that's the hard, that's the, uh, yeah, that's, hard, that's harder and notably harder. Yeah. Not super hard. There's a version, right, of this where you can use this to extend also ra ra like um, rational points to integral points, right? But that's, but that's the easy part. That's the that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. great thing. That's the easy direction. I'm, I'm saying this yeah. because this is useful in practice. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Al although anyone who's clear denominators in the past already, <laughs> already sold with <laughs> But, uh, but yes, it's true. Or, 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 I mean, if you want, you could say in terms of when you're finding Pythagorean triples, uh, then you want you intend to find rational points on the circle, and then you clear the denominators to uh, to produce Pythagorean triples. Uh, Jonathan, do you have more stuff to add? I think you were going to jump in before we got into this. Uh, yeah, a few questions have have come in. Uh, this is one that that I don't really know a, an answer to, but. Uh, it says, do, do, do separateness and properness imply anything about the Zariski topological space? Ah. Let me see why, let me answer that. Uh, nothing I'm gonna say is gonna be surprising to Jonathan, but, uh, but the, uh, let, so the answer is no for the following reason, no in any reasonable sense for the following reason that the, 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 the issue is that the right notion of Hausdorff involves mucking is not just about the topology, it's about products. Uh, and so the fact that when you take the product of X with itself over Y, the topology, the algebra in, infects the topology once you take fiber products. So it's, a, and so you, so, so uh, it can't just be about the topology. And so, uh, but if you if it's over the complex numbers, and we defined I, analytification, I think we've uh, so some of you at least have defined it. We, de we definitely uh, defined analytification. Yeah. So in that case, Hausdorff implies Hausdorff, like separated implies separated, and proper implies proper. Not that that's obvious. I, let me see which one might be obvious. What I, don't think think either we, I don't think we talked about the def the topological definition of proper, right? About the image of of Compacts being compact. Uh, let's see. Uh, Under proper motion. The image yeah. of compacts of compact is always compact, but um, yes. uh, partially it's because I always forget. Uh, this is the bad thing about proper. My mind has gotten so. I think the first time I really remembered what proper was was already when I was learning algebraic geometry. I mean, I've never have learned. Like, is, there, is there a proper mapping theorem? Is that like a theorem? That's a theorem. It sounds like it. Something that, that means something. I have no idea what it's about, but it must be way more important than anything I'm talking about. I mean, I know that if you, in, uh, one thing that I always remember is that if you take in analytic world, if you take uh, a map of the complex numbers to the complex numbers, which is proper, then it has to be a polynomial, right? So if you take any like holomorphic function, right? And you assume that it's proper. So in, implicitly in there, it's forced to be finite to one. Is that part of, but we have to remember the definition of proper. That's an awkward thing about it. Yeah. Um, which is but the embarrassing thing. The I don't think I, I, I don't think we should be admitting this in public that we don't remember what proper means. <laughs> so it's, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to excise this when we. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So someone in someone in Zulip will know what proper really means, like in the real world uh, or in the real mathematical world, uh, where real is blackboard well, bold. I mean, oh yeah, Jonathan. Really yeah, yeah, through the preimage of compact is compact, right? In the Hausdorff situation. There we go. Great. There you go. That's the definition of proper. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but but of course that's not the right definition if you're not talking about uh, locally compact house space spaces. 
so then presumably the uh, uh, so this if you take the right uh, so there should be a way i presume of taking a definition that works in both cases at the same time in the same way that our improved version of house dwarf uh that it's separated one, right? so. yeah exactly so presumably the notion of proper in algebraic geometry came from the older one yeah. by by simply phrasing it in a more categorical way. Yeah, yeah. The one proves that that uh, pre-image of compact is compact is equivalent to universal yeah. uh, un under suitable hypotheses. Right. I think prop was is supposed to be clean. Ah. So I thought it was supposed to be like clean over something. Okay, that's. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I, I. That would even make. Okay, that's that's uh, that's maybe, way. Maybe someone that, who's French can uh, say something about this, but yeah. But um, they have to be mathematicians who also speak right. People who speak yeah. French mathematics, right? Someone who's learned, uh, yeah. Uh, not someone like me who could like verify what a word might mean, but not know mathematically what that would. Okay, that, I I'd have to rethink. That may make that may change how I think about things. That may be like a well chosen word that will make me think about properness in a different way. Yeah. Uh, but I have to digest that. That's useful. Where separate is just horrible. That's a terrible name. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, I think it. Yeah, I think that comes from the way that they talk about the the those topology axioms in in French. That's what. You know? Okay. Why don't they just call it house door? Because right, it's a German name. I understand. Okay. It's a. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. there, there are more more questions here uh if you good fire away yes please uh, uh is the image of a separated scheme always separated uh is uh no for the following here's a dumb counter example uh take the line with the doubled origin and map two copies of the line to it or actually everything is covered by affines so the unit distant unit of affines that's right it, yeah. it, it also works so yeah uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a, here's another one. Uh, you talk about uh, hold on a sec, Zabi. Uh, P diagonal properties. Uh, what about applying that to the diagonal? That's good. So yeah, do you repeatedly like P diagonal diagonal properties? Oh, yes. oh, so you like weaken your condition by. So I believe. Yeah, actually, I, I said things a couple of weeks ago when I was thinking about this. Uh, that was exactly. That so let me say that if you take a right if you take a morphism, let's see if I do this the right way. Uh, yeah, let me just say. Uh, Where's your table? Yeah, but, but yes, what's that? Can Can go back to the table? table again. Of, sure, uh, but that's not that's not going to help too much because those I didn't put too much in there. But it's the notion. There it is. Right. Um, let's see. But the, the clear one, the one to look out for is the, well, actually the surjective one, uh, and, but the isomorphism monomorphism. So something's a monomorphism um, if and only if the diagonal is an isomorphism. And something is a, and uh, right, so that can be a definition of monomorphism. And then arbitrary morphisms, the diagonal is a monomorphism. So that's like two after two steps, you get you you suddenly get everything. So there's not so much. Uh, there's uh, you're mm. somewhat limited. But now, if you go into something where you have higher, uh, if you deal with stacks, not sheaves, then you have one extra step. And then I think that's the useful. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, let's see if I have an example. I think I do not, but I bet there are, I, I mean, I should ask Jonathan, like are there examples where you say, talk about something, there's like quasi-affine diagonal, but is there some thing that really is, I mean, there is quasi-separated diagonal, right? There's a thing that, there's a notion of quasi-separated, which really is like one level above, like there's a name which is of that. Uh, so the conditions like this do become relevant. Um, um, off the top of my head. Uh... So maybe the, like there's quasi-compact, there's quasi-compact diagonal, otherwise known as quasi-separated. And then there's quasi-compact diagonal diagonal. Uh, and that's a, and that's a use, that's a, con, I think that has a different yeah, name, right? I, that's a, I can't, I can't remember what the names are. I mean, to. I, I can't either, but, I just, but the good thing is I don't have, I mean, whatever. 
but, but but the great thing is I get to avoid ever uh, remembering, right? If you say, if you think about it the right way, like the phrase quasi alpine diagonal is great because you know what that means, right? I, I don't need to remember or look up what that means. It means what it means. Uh, but other things, you know, or maybe it doesn't mean what I thought it meant. No, no, I was gonna say, I remember some, some discussion on math overflow a long time ago. Uh, somebody trying to, to um, uh, you know, take a quotient of, uh, of something like the complex numbers by Z as an algebraic space, right? Yep. Which should be C star in, uh, I mean, and you can take that quotient and, and get a, a natal sheaf, um, yep. but, but then you get the, the diagonal, the diagonal is not quasi compact. Right. One of these. Uh, yeah, things. right, exactly. And that's the thing, the thing that's missing, we, we have a hard time saying what's wrong with that example, because it's quasi, it's diagonal, I better be careful. Maybe the diagonal is quasi compact, and it's a diagonal diagonal that's not quite like it's something that you normally don't have a word for. Uh, yeah, I have to think about it to try and. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it, I don't yeah, exactly. I think that, yeah. So C the quotient the quotient C, the quotient stack C mod Z is the uh, for anyone who knows about quotients. Right, it's not a it's not a scary quotients are not scary usually. It's like a very reasonable stack, but something's wrong with it. It's like I. I and you have to say what you mean by, it. yeah, what's wrong with it? And then you're led to give it a name. Yeah. First it's an expletive, but then later on you have to have a better name. Yeah. So someone asked, um, what happens if we, ask, if we ask the diagonal be open instead of closed? Ah, but it's locally closed for sure. That's yeah. so, ah, yes. Oh, good. Oh, is that like a, that, is that, did a ringer ask that question? No, 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 just oh, asked, okay. I don't know yeah. who asked that. It was in the uh, list. So for example, an open embedding, let's see if I have a good example for, yeah, what is it when, when the diagonal is an open, like, is it for an atomomorphism? Is it, is it, uh, is the diagonal open? Yeah, yes, yes the, yeah, that right. So, uh, and it's some, maybe it's like even a characterization of atomomorphism by that plus other, some other stuff. It, it's unramified, it's the same thing. Oh, thing. unramified, ah, great. Ah, yes, that's, you're right. That's the same thing as, okay, great. So um, the notion of unramified morphism, which is exactly that, what that, what that, that excellent question, uh, what that is actually that the diagonal is open. Uh, this, and, uh, this exists versus exists unique too. Um. Yeah. So unramified, just to let people know what it means. Uh, uh, well, the great thing is I've told you what it means. It means it's, or some, uh, the diagonal is open. Uh, and, and that's got to be useful. Uh, like, uh, you, that's going to be, and that is useful. That's a useful fact about unramified morphisms because you, uh, so, and so where does it, what does that mean? How should you think about it? Well, if you have a map of manifolds, what does it mean for something to be unramified? It should mean like it's uh, like a, um, it, it's ramification number three or ramification that like uh, of a branch cover. Uh, so it's, uh, so you can write in terms of differentials. And it should be said the differentials are best understood in terms of the diagonal as well. So yet, yet again, you're dragged back to the diagonal. Yeah, so that's great. The right question, that's exactly the right question. Take like a really nice class of morphisms that uh, really does something. And it's not so obvious that, yeah, open diagonal being unramified is not an obvious statement. Like it's not a intuitively obvious, geometrically obvious statement. Um, and so it's worth, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Let me even add that in so it'll be, um, but you know, people don't have to, yeah, people don't know what the last thing is. We can define open embedding that's unramified. And one of the directions is, turns out to be cheap, but the other direction, yeah. But actually you'll find that as an exercise in the notes, yeah, even though I forgot it, but it's, uh, uh, but we need to know what differentials are to see what unramified is. Well, no, we don't. The person just defined it. It's open embedding is, uh, yeah. yeah. I can't argue with that. Uh, well, there's, this, there's this cool definition in, in Bot Schulze yeah. of uh, weekly atoll maps as, as flat with yep. diagonal. With, with, with flat with flat diagonal. That uh, flat with flat diagonal and it's weak. I wonder why they call it weekly. Okay, and for some, like, I feel like flat with flat diagonal, I, that's like, a, like a, that makes me happy. And that, but they've got some reason for calling it weak, like, uh, weekly atoll. Like for the example, for example, the fact that diagonal is open embedding meaning unramified, still it's good to have the idea of what unramified means in your head. It, so I presumably there's some reason why they call it weekly at all. That's great. Yeah. And, 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 and things descend under weekly at all. Appropriate things in appropriate sense descend. Yeah, uh, I guess why do we things like uh, um, Q bar being a weekly at all over Q? That's good. 
Oh and it's it's um, just uh, very neatly comes out to that 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 uh, <laughs> that characterization in terms of flat. Uh, with that's flat. nice. Okay, great. That's a great. So that's a definition explicitly in terms of, and that's and I love it because what must have happened is they wanted to group certain things. They realized that's what matters, and so therefore yes. this is the right yeah. definition, and that's just great. Okay, weekly tell right. And you can say what is a tell? Ah, uh, tell you have to work. You don't have to work that hard. Well, you, nice. you can say flat and unramified. That's true. And now it's flat and, oh, great. So flat and open embedding diagonal. Uh, and then weekly, yeah, it all means flat and open embedding diagonal and weekly flat. Oh, that makes even weekly tall. Is, flat? Not yet, but that's okay. Uh, but some, it's a local that, property. Yep, yeah, it's a local property. Um, so if you know what it means, you know, for. So X, we'll define flat. A morphism of schemes is flat if, well, given every point here and every point mapping to a point here, then you know that OXP is a module over OYQ. You mm -hmm. have a ring map. Uh, and if this module is a flat module, if, uh, so if it's a flat module, well, what does that mean? I'll tell you in a second. Uh, uh, if tensoring with it is an exact functor, Mm -hmm. uh, on module, then it's flat. That's definition uh, functor. I've defined it now. Very fast definition. The why you should care is the mystery, uh, is the, uh, and the fact that you should care so much that it trumps almost anything else uh, is the mystery. Um, okay, let me just write in the Bot Schulze definition. Uh, just to, uh, so what does tal mean? This is the wrong definition of etal uh, to, to start with. So I, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, I, uh, or Jonathan may disagree, disagree with me on this too. But etal uh, means that the diagonal is an open embedding, in other words, unramified, plus it's flat, a flat morphism. Is there any, wait, is there any local, there must be some finite. No, problem. no. No, okay. Yeah. All right, because open, ah. Oh, okay. you're you're saying there's no finite type condition? Is that what you're saying? It, oh, it comes oh, sorry, to the right. Sorry, I thought you meant for Bot Schultz. Uh, oh yeah, right. Uh, maybe you have to say locally finite presentation. Yeah. Okay. But for great. So then, Bot and Schultz to say, well, all that really matters. So open embeddings are flat. That's because the stocks. In this case, these are. This is an isomorphism. Um, so then you can relax that to flat diagonal. Diagonal is flat plus flat. So put that way, that's why they call it, that, that justifies the, it's like a tall, but less so. Uh, it's a weekly tall. Okay, that, that's great. Great, it's more, more questions that are, I, I, um, I don't know, so some people, some, uh, let's see what else we had. I mean, someone asked, you know, what is a morphism of, of, of uh, schemes? Are there two different morphisms of schemes which are the same as underlying map of topological spaces? We talked about that one with the, you know, anything that's not reduced. Um, and they gave a couple other examples in, in, in the chat. Um, I get it. Okay, great. Uh, what other ones? I think we pretty much covered them all. I'm trying to look here. Um, you know, why are you so against evaluative criteria? I'm not against it. Some of my best friends are evaluative criteria. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 no, uh, I, it, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> Lots of people ask me this fact, and I should say I'm actually not against evaluative criteria at all. I just believe that you should use uh, technology in an appropriate, like, like I feel uh, if you're going to use a bazooka to kill a fly, you should know you're using a bazooka. At least you should be open about it. Uh, and and I think it causes misunderstanding. And I do think actually, you said, where I think a lot of people think projective space is proper for the wrong reasons. Uh, whereas in fact, it's like a more, uh, it, it sounds like it's, a, it, it's more my feeling about what things should be called easy and hard, where some things are true for easy reasons, some things are true for harder reasons. And I think it's really good, not just to know the things that are true, but to also know kind of how hard they are because then I find I can remember why they're true. Because like, the facts that are easy, like, they're facts that I can just follow my nose and prove. I like that because I don't have to remember the facts anymore. 
uh, and then there are ones that require me to think. Um, I, I will say it's entirely possible I've never gone through the full proof of the validity of criteria and appropriateness in the sense that there's a, a little bit of evaluation theory, which is not hard. And I can't remember if I actually got around to ever going through it. Uh, just the fact that the intersect, uh, what, what was the, well, I wouldn't even try to say what it is. Can't, I can't remember. In the case of a discrete evaluation when you're in the finite type setting, that's way easier. But like the crawl at Kazuki theorem, uh, I, I can't remember. I don't, maybe never read that proof, but it's in, and it's, I'm happy it's true and I'm happy people use it. And I'm happy, I, it's, not, it's not that I dislike it. It just, uh, I just don't understand why it's true. Um, and I never felt the need to, uh, although I know I could. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, but I should say, I do appreciate it when there are things, and maybe Jonathan is the cause of a good number of these, where I don't, I, a good reason to express distrust of something is someone will then give a good reason for uh, why you should care. And then I really understand in my gut, like the various things like Krell's uh, principal ideal theorem, uh, I now uh, really appreciate it in its proof. And I feel like, I, and I appreciate it more and more the more I think about it. Whereas, but then, the main thing is somewhat people would what matters is someone tells me why do you hate crawl so much versus here's a case why you should love crawl and i think it's the uh so hence the always the question is if someone's going to ask me why i hate something I, I don't hate it why do you love it so much like what's the uh can you prove it off the top of your head uh, what do you use it for and there's something for the valid criteria is perfectly suited but not uh I, Let me give an example. Yeah, what's that? I, I, I'll try and make the case for uh, value. The value <laughs> uh, so, well, except that with the case you're going to make, I already probably agree with. So, I mean, you I, mean, okay, I, I have two arguments uh, yeah. th that I can try and make. The, the easier one is, is moduli. And, and, <laughs> the, the functor of points, uh, the value of criteria are built for yeah. the functor of points. And so, yeah. if you're studying moduli, um, I mean, when I teach, you on that. When I teach yep. the value of criteria or the definition and, the, and the, the other thing is a theorem that it's equivalent to. That's because you're thinking, yeah. In the mind I theoretically, I like, yeah. So, you, but, you, but I already agreed with that. Like, I feel like, but that's not a hard, that's, you don't think of, you, right, I know. But I agree with you on that as you probably already know. Yeah, so, so let me try and make a different argument, which is that if you're talking about things that are not of finite type, uh, sometimes you care about things that satisfy the value of criteria that don't have a chance of being proper. And, uh, I'm not uh, but, exactly but, now you're, you're, but now you're arguing against yourself because they aren't proper. <laughs> no, but, but it means something. It means complete. It means things have limits, but- the I completely agree. Impact. Like, like and I'm know. completely, and so valuation theory in general, I'm completely not, I mean, uh, yeah, valuations are, I, I agree with you again, uh, or in some sense valuations are, but uh, yeah, yeah, there I agree as well. But uh, let me give you an example of, a, of, of an incorrect use of value, the value criterion. People like proving the Hilbert scheme is projective. Uh, I think often is that what you are using, like you buy, when you construct it, it's automatically quasi projective. It's an open subset. It's locally closed in projective space. So when you are showing using the value criterion, it's the value criterion of showing a locally closed subset is closed. Like it's not, there's no valuation theory in that really. It's just, that's all, or at least that. So that, so it, it hides something by, uh, by say the, uh, that, yeah, it's a local criteria, value criteria of being closed, of locally closing being closed. Uh, and so you don't need, uh, it is, I mean, it's no, just, no, no, I, I'm laughing because, because this is the, the, the sort of thing that I do all the time that, uh, you're telling me is wrong. <laughs> like, like, I, I think I even had a paper where I recently, where I, where I proved something was closed using the validative criterion, like a closed sub scheme. No, but that, but that, no, but that's okay. As long as you're not calling it the validative, I mean, it, it, but it, it is a valid criterion of properness, but it's something you don't need. Like we could have done the value criterion of closed things being, uh, 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 well, I guess we need a little bit of dimension theory and then we might get into Kuala Kazuki. <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so I think uh, I, 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 I uh, yeah, right. No, but, but that's because the value criterion is like a grown up version 
of the value of criterion of locally closed things being closed. That's that. I mean, that's a feature, not a bug. But you shouldn't. You know, it's like. A, a, yeah, I guess it's always like you know. I'm impressed by people who use who. Uh, what's the, uh, the example I would use is like a, like Jack Jack Hall is a, an example of someone who has way more tools at his disposal than any reasonable person, but he always knows the right tool for the job. Like it's not like he only he and and I think that's why he can prove things other people can't prove because he pulls out like he you know he. He pulls out the you know the the monstrous backpack powered tool to when he to blow something away, but he also then and of course he builds the tool by you know putting levers in and putting in, he just understands how they work. So um, yeah, so I, I yeah I really don't hate it. It's just that would you like would it be good for me to spend an hour getting an evaluation theory at this point? in Agitalk. And I think the answer, I say the answer is no. Uh, and uh, I, I think the answer is no. And a good clue for this is places where they do things in this way, they pump the community development. This is where you say, oh yes, of course you've taken a community development course before in which you learn valuation theory. And that's maybe not the, it may be the case in some countries where you learn valuation theory like in grade five, but uh, but I think it tends not to be, I feel like you shouldn't need to know evaluation theory to know what compactness, like what, uh, the analog of Hausdorff or I mean, yeah, evaluation theory is harder than Hausdorff. Hausdorff is something you should see. Uh, Hausdorff is something undergrad should see, I think. Yeah. But okay, I, this always comes across like I'm unloading on valuation. So uh, I absolutely do not hate them. I love them, uh, but only, you know, I love them only for what they are good for, which is a lot. Um, but you misunderstand what, but not you don't misunderstand, but people misunderstand what valuations are good for if they don't see what they actually are good for. Like, uh, so. Yeah. Uh, one more plug, China changing the topic, but you know, the theorem you stated that uh, proper and affine is the same thing as finite. The, yeah, 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 yeah. The value of criterion of properness plus affine is the same thing as integral, which is. Uh, uh, what was the statement? If, uh, value of right. Here you go. The value of criterion of properness plus uh, affine is the same thing as integral. That's neat. And I never heard of it. That's cool. That's great. Uh, I even have to. Th uh, that's great. Okay. So, so yeah, integral. The other one follows by just adding finite type. Oh. I, okay. That that uh, that makes me happy because that that fits in like. Yeah, that adds part of the story in the right. Yeah, that's great. That's not even obvious to me why it's true. I need to think a little bit about why that's true. So uh, what do you need? Value to create, okay, okay. And you, we need to say what value, which uh, I'll ask you later for the statement, whether it's for not just for just, it's for discrete valuation rings, if you assume finite tightness, and it's for arbitrary valuation rings, if you don't, I guess that's the statement. Yeah, the, there's, uh, there's a characterization of integrally closed. Uh, in terms of valuation, it's in a Tia McDonald, and and if you interpret it geometrically, it, it's this. That's nice. That's beautiful. Okay, that might be less hard to prove. Yeah. Okay, I like that. That's great. That, that this is the kind of value. Yeah, that's that makes me happy. That's a good value. Yeah, I like that value criterion. That's almost as good as the value criterion of locally closed things being closed. I think that's uh, that's. Yeah. So I think that's that's uh, pretty much it. I know we wandered off the, uh, uh, we wandered off a little bit, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Well, in that case, we will meet one more time uh, in a week's time. And I, 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 I want to say if people have requests or suggestions to say them, but uh, and I do say that. It's just that it's hard to think of what, if you, stuff that we are primed to do now, that would be fun to do. And that's, uh, uh, that's, Set it limited by both criteria. <laughs> uh, great. Okay, good. So next week, same time, uh, same place, and uh, have a good week. And I'll kill at least YouTube, not the entire YouTube.